hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel, Embodied Solidarities. My name is Avi Bukli and I'll be chairing uh, today's panel. Um, uh, in terms of housekeeping, just a couple of things. Um, so each presentation will be about 10 minutes long. And um, during the presentations, please feel free to use the chat box and add any questions, comments and so forth. I'll be picking up these and uh, hopefully we'll have some time for uh, Q&A at the end of the presentations. Um, I will be introducing um, every single speaker in turn. So we'll start first of all with our first speaker and the first presentation. Um, our first presentation is by Dr. Nekla Achik and the title is Finding my voice as a Kurdish woman migrant scholar. Um, Nicola, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Hi, I can see myself now. Sorry. Um, yes, thank you for inviting me and nice to see you. And um, it's a very um, interesting um, event and usually I have PowerPoints but for this one I decided not to. I just wanted to talk freely because here, you know, today I am here with my different identity. So just to introduce myself, I'm Nechla Acek and I'm a research fellow at Middlesex University. And so my kind of official identity is the work I do. I've been doing at Middlesex University, University of Manchester. Currently, I'm working on GCRF funded project on migration, gender and development. And um, another project I'm working is a horizon one on participation, with look, which looks at social polarization, extremism and radicalization in Europe. So I've always worked in research and on large scale research projects and these are the kind of projects I always worked on. But today the kind of things I want to talk is more personal and it's more related to my, I would say, unofficial identity. I say unofficial because it's kind of features less in the work I've, I do in these in my official jobs. Um, and it never really fits in the public academic profile that I'm trying to build up for myself in order to be employable in the um, academic sector. So it's basically my interest in Kurdish gender studies and my activism as um, feminist and within the Kurdish Women Studies Network and the Kurdish Gender Studies Network. So just a few words about myself. I'm from Germany, a Kurdish immigrant. But I've lived in the UK longer than in Kurdistan, Turkey or Germany. So migration plays therefore a defining role in my personal and professional identity. Um, and doing research on the Kurdish issue uh, and on Kurds involves to a certain extent also exploring or has always involved also exploring my own identity. And, you know, when I reflect on it, perhaps maybe it's an attempt to reconnect to my roots and seek validation and show to my community or, to, you know, that I understand their pain and suffering. So therefore, my research interest in Kurdish studies has, in Kurdish gender studies has therefore never been purely academic. Um, and um, it is, you know, as we said in the first presentation, it is very personal. Um, um, as well as political and the lines between these two spheres has never been clear cut or separate from each other, always intertwined, fluid and blurry. So, um, and I see my engagement with Kurdish gender studies as an embodied experience because it consumes my mind, my emotions, it's part of my identity and it's not something that, can I, that I can easily shake off. Um, so from for me, my academic career has a much deeper purpose when it comes to my engagement with Kurdish gender studies, and it motivates me to kind of continue and work on my research in ways that I don't feel when I work project based, uh, that are being funded and so on. So, but I want to go beyond my own experience today and want to make the argument that um, this is also the case for many other Kurdish gender scholars, Kurdish gender studies scholars. Um, and I have come to realize that especially um, through the Kurdish gender studies network, which, which was established um, in during the pandemic. But before I kind of talk about it, I want to give a um, brief overview about 
the Kurds, I, just because I don't know what kind of audience we have. So very briefly, Kurds are the largest non-state nation in the world. They are one of the oldest native and indigenous populations of the Middle East. And, uh, you know, they occupy a great geographical area that's stretched between uh, Syria, Iraq, Iran and Turkey. So they are not a state on their own. Um, there are a lot of commonalities between the Kurds in those different areas, um, but also differences. And I'm going to just focus on Turkey today because I'm from Turkey, North Kurdistan. And um, yeah, and I also, um, it, it also represents the biggest proportion of Kurds from Turkey and the Kurdish women's movement and the women's movement have been the strongest. So it makes sense to focus on that. So just a few more words on the Kurdish women's movement in northern Kurdistan, Turkey. You know, just to sum it up, maybe uh, gender, women's and gender issues, women and gender issues played an important role in the Kurdish question. So first of all, the oppression of Kurds was justified by their supposed backwardness and the supposedly more strictly patriarchal gender relations were used as a justification by the Turkish state for the oppression of Kurds. So this goes back to the civilization project that nation states claim. Um, so the Kurds were seen as backward and therefore in need of civilization and modernity. And then the second uh, aspect is that when the Kurdish national movement began, they also used gender politics as an important way to mobilize, especially, for example, during the 80s and 90s, gender equality was an important aim of the Kurdish national movement in principle, although not always in pra praxis, practice. So that is kind of related to gender and ethnicity, nation building debates. You know, you have seen similar trends within the Kurdish movement. And then um, there was an armed conflict in, which peaked in the 90s um, and women were the mostly affected by it. So their livelihoods were affected. Their work of caring for their families was made much more difficult. They were also more excluded from education and paid work and made more dependent on their families. So, um, and another aspect is as women became active within the Kurdish national movement, they also became um, prime targets of counterinsurgency measures, which involved widespread sexual violence and rape in police custodies. So the point I'm trying to make is here that gender issues have always been key, uh, a key issue within the Kurdish national movement. And despite all the economic hardship, political persecution, the Kurdish women's movement developed from strength to strength and became really well organized, a well organized force within the Kurdish movement. So without going like into detail, like one in one article that I've co-authored with Professor Umut Errol, she is from your university, we, um, an article that we published in Gender, Culture and Society in 2019, we argue that within the Kurdish movement, Kurdish women insisted on, insisted on the implementation of three policies to ensure that Kurdish women's movement continues to grow and maintain its strength within the movement. So we were looking at, we know that uh, national movements usually tend to co-opt women and then we have seen different developments with the Kurdish movement. And we, we kind of arguing that it's related to two, three policies, which I think is also important for like other movements. It's the introduction of a gender quota to ensure that women are represented equally within pro-Kurdish parties and in elected position, which really, which really had an effect that women, they try to, you know, implement and practice these quotas. And then women's assemblies on all levels, local, regional, um, national, where a lot of issues related like to gender were discussed and only they could discuss and, de and decide, decide on it. And they were also putting candidates for elections. So they didn't leave it to the male leadership. And then the most important one is the introduction and implementation of the co-chair system, a very unique type of policy where any leadership positions such as party leadership, councillors, mayor positions are occupied by a man and a woman at the same time and decisions are taken based on consensus. So we 
we argue that these three policies really widened and strengthened the women's role within the Kurdish political movement and within politics in Turkey. And this is quite an achievement within a relatively short period um, of time in Turkey, you know, given that politics everywhere, but especially in Turkey, is very highly gendered. Um, and, and then coming now back to academic work, so Kurdish gender studies is quite new. But that's because of the problems associated with the Kurdish issue in general. So in Turkey, like until 2000, the conditions to be engaged in academic research on Kurds or Kurdish were almost absent and very minimal, very difficult. The Kurds were the suspect community of the Middle East, governed by counterterrorism and anti-insurgency laws. So therefore, any research on Kurds was deemed as being highly political and contentious in nature. Uh, so for fear of persecution meant that students, scholars, departments, universities, they were really careful how, you know, whether to work on it and how they would engage and, and if they do at all. So, um, and then many people who decide to do research on it, they were aware of the pitfalls engaging in this topic and they knew that it would rarely provide a smooth career path into established um, academia. On the contrary, scholars engaging in Kurdish studies are more penalized and rewarded for their academic work. So therefore, the diaspora and um, academic opportunities outside Kurdistan played a very important role in ensuring that Kurdish gender studies kind of developed. Uh, there are very few departments and research centers that promote Kurdish gender studies or Kurdish studies in general. And um, the emergence of Kurdish gender studies is much more recent compared to like Kurdish studies in general. Um, um, and so the Kurdish gender studies network, sorry, I'm just going to talk about it briefly. There were some attempts to establish Kurdish, to bring together all the scholars who work on uh, gender studies within Kurdish gender studies. And um, it kind of, it was in 98, 99, but then it dissolved. It wasn't sustainable because of lack of institutional support, lack of funding. But with uh, the COVID pandemic, it was suddenly possible to come online, you know, despite the geographical locations, different geographical Graphical uh, location and the group of feminist scholars with an interest in Kurdish studies from Canada, US, and Europe. They organized the first meeting in summer 2000, and then very quickly from there they organized the first lectureship series. And then in the second year they organized uh, lots of workshops, panel discussions, continued with the lectureship series, and also a reading group. And what is interesting and different to, you know, the network that's, that was established like two decades ago is that it includes many more young Kurdish scholars who started with their academic career in Kurdistan. Obviously, in 1980s, 19, it wasn't possible to have anything like that. So now with 2000, in 2000, there was some kind of liberalization, so it was possible. So now you had them come into Europe, North America, they were continuing with their studies. There were no well, possibility to do it in Kurdistan or in Turkey, so they continued doing it abroad. So these were people involved in the network. And it also included a new generation of young non-Kurdish scholars who developed an interest in Kurdish gender studies through the Rojava revolution, which is like the northern Syrian parts, the resistance of the Kurds and the autonomy they have there currently. So the Kurdish that's because the Kurdish movement in general has been really keen to reach out to an international women's organizations and an audience. And the Genoa project, for example, like Women's Village Project or the Genealogy Project have galvanized considerable support and interest from political groups and individuals across the globe. And these projects, in a sense, are a response to a long term oppression of the Kurds and aim to create spaces for women and decolonize knowledge production, focusing on the lived experiences of Kurdish women living in Kurdistan. So uh, the vibrant engagement of scholars and activists with the events, workshops, reading groups organized by the Kurdish Gender Studies Network demonstrates the need for exchange, support, guidance and solidarity. So the Kurdish Gender Studies Network kind of serves as a substitute for lack of institutional support, many young scholars in Kurdish Gender Studies experience. 
and there's also a great interest in decoloniality, decolonization debates within the network that's very critical about hierarchies of knowledge production within Kurdish gender studies specifically. So just to conclude, I don't know whether I'm running out of time. So just to conclude, engagement with Kurdish gender studies is highly embodied experience. Kurdish studies and Kurdish gender studies are not mainstream subject areas and they enjoy little institutional support. And the Kurdish issue has been a contentious issue, making engagement with the topic really difficult, troublesome and risky on certain levels. Therefore, for majority of scholars, those who are getting engaged in this topic, either because they are from that region directly, uh, like, you know, or um, affected by the struggle through their, uh, and indirectly affected by the struggle, or it's through their activism, they develop an affinity with the people and their cause and interest in Kurdish studies. So as the indigenous scholar Linda T. Y. Smith asserts, research with marginalized and indigenous group is a long-term process and requires research to prioritize the interest of the communities centering around their perspectives and knowledge. So for those scholars who take this seriously, doing Kurdish studies is embodied solidarities and not just a research project that serves the purpose of one's own academic career or reputation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Masha. Thank you, and uh, um, I, I cannot wait for the for the uh, questions at the end. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll have a, a very interesting discussion. Um, uh, let's move straight away to our second presentation uh, by Dr. Olga Jurash, and the title is "Women's Participation in Online Spaces: Equality Reimagined." Thank you, Avi, and uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here and I would like to continue uh, with the theme of this event, which is, I think, solidarities, uh, but also bringing in the theme of um, today's International Women's Day, which is break the bias. And actually, I can think of no better example of where these ideas simultaneously reinforce and simultaneously clash than actually online spaces. And uh, online spaces and women's participation within them and legal responses to the abuse that women face within online spaces has been a theme of, of my research for the past few years. So um, I'm delighted to be able to share some of my thoughts uh, today, although I do appreciate that it's quite difficult to squeeze uh, years of research into 10 minutes, uh, and that's not the purpose of what I'm trying to do anyway. Uh, so anyway, this uneasy dynamic between um, kind of solidarity and online participation and, and abuse that women um, face in online spaces has implications for women who participate online, but also it carries broader societal implications, uh, including impact on gender equality, equality of representation, diversity of voices in the public debate, but also, and ultimately to me, uh, this is quite important, it carries consequences for the shape and quality of democracy um, that we live in. As we know, and I hope a majority of people experience the, um, the nicer part of participating online and um, nicer part of occupying online spaces, uh, that really from the start were supposed to be equalizing spaces, spaces where people can express themselves freely, um, where their views can enrich public debate, open up opportunities to connect, to network, to organize, really irrespectively of people's backgrounds um, and their actually geographical boundaries. So in that sense, the internet and the rise of online spaces has really opened up a lot of opportunities on previously, I think, unprecedented uh, basis. And this, of course, has been utilized by women and especially by feminists who have been using these online spaces to organize, to campaign, to protest, importantly, um, to express both solidarity and resistance, but also to draw international attention to sometimes issues that are local or, or regional, if you like. And just a couple of examples that uh, you see here are, for example, women's strike in Poland, uh, which has gained actually quite international support. Um, but also, I think we can 
all recall uh, women's activism online during the Arab Spring uh, just over the over a decade ago. Uh, so as I said, online spaces um, are actually fantastic when it comes to women also organizing, showing um, resistance to uh, social norms such as um, in my selfie freedom, which you can uh, see at the bottom of the uh, of the screen right now, so bottom uh, bottom right. But also um, use when women use online spaces uh, to campaign for change of laws and policies, such as Valerie's Law or Reclaim the, Reclaim these streets, which I'm sure we all have come across when we are on social media, or at least we've heard about. But also what we witness in online spaces is what I refer to as feminist creativity in organizing and in campaigning or protesting. And um, the example I would like to bring here is uh, Me Too or Rice Bunny, if you um, if you like. And this is really a great example um, of how women really um, express their creativity in and found solutions to overcoming censorship uh, in online spaces in China, which banned Me Too, as we know, hashtag Me Too, and instead uh, used letters in Mandarin, which um, describe rice bunny. So uh, I don't speak Mandarin, so a little disclaimer here, um, but I believe that uh, me means rice and two means bunny. Uh, which I think is quite humorous, but actually um, had quite great practical consequences in a way that it allowed um, the Me Too movement to actually grow um, over there, despite um, obvious constraints of, um, of censorship. However, um, I wish I could just stop here and say everything is fantastic in online spaces, but I think we all know that this is not true. And the ideal of internet as an equal participatory space is effectively on everyday basis, minute by minute, all over the world, undermined by online abuse that is directed at women. And this has been, this is really nothing new. <laughs> it has been recognized internationally, domestically, regionally. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women um, recognized in 2018 that actually despite the benefits and empowering potential of the internet, women and girls across the world have increasingly voiced their concern at harmful, sexist, misogynistic and violent content and behavior online. Um, and I'm sad to report that not much has changed uh, since 2018. Um, so the backlash suffered by women continues. Um, backlash suffer, a backlash that women receive just for really daring to be online or to express an opinion online. Um, and it, it's been really growing since. I mean, it's great that we know more about it and we now have data to really back it up. Data that's actually um, it's quite heartbreaking, I think, if you if you read lots of it. So just to give you some examples, um, the 2021 Girl Guiding Survey revealed that 71% of girls and young women, and the young women here are uh, in the age group between 7 and 21 years old, have experienced some form of online harm in the year preceding the survey, so roughly 2022-2021. And this can be uh, anything as such as online harassment, bullying or hate speech, for instance. The 2021 report by economist and by the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, stated that 40 percent of women who were surveyed worldwide have been harassed online and 85 percent have witnessed harassment or other forms of online violence whilst being online. The 2021 uh, UN Women APPG for UN Women report in the UK showed that 17% of women in the UK reported feeling unsafe and or uncomfortable as a result of comments or jokes uh, that were made online. So these are just these are just a few examples of some data that is coming through that captures women's experiences, but there's of course much more, and it's actually quite overwhelming um, to see the 
I guess, the, the impact and the scale um, of online abuse against women um, that we witness really worldwide. And specifically at international level, attention has been additionally drawn to online abuse experienced by women who can be described as either having a high profile or otherwise being in the public eye. So we're thinking here about politicians, journalists, uh, but also human rights defenders. And the impact that this had on representation of women and women's voices in the public sphere, but also, for instance, in relation to online violence against women in politics, uh, representation of women uh, in parliaments, in local governments, uh, you name it, uh, the, the consequences of women are such that increasing amount of um, women are actually making a tough decision to withdraw from their career, for instance, in politics, because of the abuse they suffered, but also the other effect that this abuse has um, on their co-workers, on their families, and so on. So the impact that online abuse has on women's participatory rights is quite significant. And not only it really goes against the very principle of non-discrimination of women in public and political life, which is embedded in CEDAW, uh, but also actually puts in question um, women's ability to exercise their freedom of expression without fear of abuse, discrimination, or other repercussions. Unfortunately, but I'm sad to say not infrequently, Freedom of expression is nonetheless pitched as a right standing somehow, to me bizarrely, in opposition to gender equality. So very often in the debates surrounding regulation or how should we respond to um, online violence, we see this kind of theme emerging where it's either freedom of expression or gender equality. And I find qu something quite disturbing about it. Uh, because at least my view is that the two are mutually reinforcing rather than standing in opposition to one another. And online abuse um, of women also leads to a number of online and offline harms, um, but also not, not all of them are adequately recognized or captured in the legal system. So whilst we've seen some progress for instance, economic reputational harms uh, associated with online abuse start to gain some recognition and ultimately what follows redress within the law. Uh, democratic harms or a broader societal harms arising for, from such forms of abuse are not. And this is specifically the case um, with online abuse perpetuating normalization of violence against women to the extent that it is hardly, I think, hardly anymore shaking the public conscience, despite, I think we agree, volumes and hypervisibility of such abuse, particularly on social media platforms. And last but not least, um, online abuse effectively silences women's voices, often prompting them to withdraw from the public sphere, which of course has implications not only for representation of women's voices in the public debate, but ultimately the question of democracy and the quality of this democracy. Um, so I guess the big question is, what should law do about it, if anything, or what should law not do about it, perhaps? Um, well, firstly, I think we need to recognize the problem, name it, and, uh, and tackle it. Um, I think it's crucial that online abuse is recognized as an obstacle to re realization of other rights, such as freedom of expression, um, participation in public and political life. But also, I would love to see law reform <laughs> that goes far enough to actually capture the widespread impact of online abuse and recognizes online harms uh, that arise as a consequence. But and I think it's perhaps quite pragmatic <laughs> rather than uh, rather than a utopian thing to say. Um, I think the equality of online spaces is a shared responsibility. It's a goal and it's a shared goal which requires social, cultural and legal change. Um, I think where social and cultural change is concerned, we need to challenge normalization of violence against women, not only online but also offline. Uh, 
uh, in its everyday forms and challenge it every day, not only on International Women's Day, and challenge the narrative or rather subvert the narrative um, from what women must do to protect themselves online to rather what are the responsibilities of everyone else who also participates online in order to make these spaces inclusive and equal. And when, when law is concerned, of course, I think mean, the healthy dose of realism would, uh, would suggest that uh, law alone cannot affect change. It's only one of the tools in the toolbox. But of course, as a lawyer, I would say that it is important to have good laws. Uh, and what I mean by good is laws that capture contemporary reality that women face online, but also laws that by design, not by being an afterthought, by rather by design are created to respond to and to tackle um, online abusive behaviors. And um, I will just finish with drawing your attention to the quote that is um, in the picture right now. It's a quote from a Spanish feminist Concepcion Arenal, um, which loosely translated uh, goes, uh, bad laws will always find and contribute to forming men uh, worse than themselves in charge of executing them. And I think to me, uh, that's perhaps a good place to finish as it captures, I think, my thoughts on why we need good laws going forward. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga. And our uh, third and last, but definitely not least, presentation for today is by Dr. Jacob Breslow. Uh, Jacob, do you have any slides for us? Excellent. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, um, Abby, and thanks for everyone for including me here today in this panel. It's a real pleasure. Um, as I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to jump uh, right into the paper, and I assume we can have some time for discussion at the end. And this um, paper comes from an article of mine that was recently published in Feminist Theory about trans childhood and what I've been calling turf grammar. Um, and today I'm going to focus specifically on how the question of cis and trans solidarity emerges and then is contested within that grammar. In 2018, Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist and author, released Trans Kids, It's Time to Talk, a Channel 4 documentary that she also wrote, directed, and starred in. The documentary follows O'Malley as she distresses over the allegedly staggering increase in children being referred to the Tavistock Clinic, uh, which houses the Gender Identity Development Service and is the largest provider of trans affirmative services in the UK. Uh, and O'Malley reflects on how to make sense of her own gendering as both a child and adult. In the opening scene, O'Malley is joined by a few friends at a pub where she reminisces over their childhood together. From as early back as I can remember, she narrates, I genuinely thought I should be a boy. I believe that these days this would be called gender dysphoria, but back then, as far as I was concerned, people had to accept me as a boy. Integral to O'Malley's reading of her childhood, however, is that O'Malley is grateful that despite her trans childhood, she grew up to be a cis woman. She says, I'm so happy being a woman now, and I'm so very much accepting of who I am, but I'm 43 now, if I lived 33, 35 years later, I think without a doubt I would have been that kid who would have been online, who would have got those hormone treatments, who would have transitioned. I think without a doubt I would have transitioned. As this statement ends and the conversation between O'Malley and her friends is wrapped up for the documentary, a lone fragment of a sentence is uttered just barely audible beneath the documentary's music track fading in. It's that fear that children. How are we meant to seriously grapple with this line of thinking? On one hand, O'Malley is describing the complexities of growing up in the 70s and 80s as a masculine presenting child at a time when there were really rather limited avenues for articulating gendered subjectivity outside of a rigid and hyperbolic binary. O'Malley's tomboy childhood is thus a truth to her experience of boyhood, as well as a critique of the patriarchal and misogynistic frameworks of femininity that were demanded of girls and punished in boys. It's no surprise, in other words, that O'Malley's challenge to patriarchal binary gender oriented her towards the claiming of boyhood. Boyhood was, and in many ways still is, conflated with freedom, agency, autonomy, and liberal subjecthood. So O'Malley is thus giving an account of childhood freedom under the sign of boyhood that she is proud of and attached to. And this too should be no surprise. 
to manage to find avenues for resistance amidst the challenges of interpersonal and systemic sexism, particularly as a child, is an extraordinary feat. Taking O'Malley's boyhood seriously then suggests that she's articulating the need for a space within the highly gendered time of childhood in which children can seek out modes of freedom and autonomy through the limited and flawed avenues that gender makes available. What becomes tricky, however, is when O'Malley's attachment to this memory of her boyhood is mapped onto a different historical moment, wherein it's no longer read as an enactment of O'Malley's feminist resistance, but is rather read through a contemporary lens of transness as a threat to feminism, as well as to O'Malley herself. Jumping from this memory of the 1970s to a hypothetical narrative of the late 2010s, O'Malley argues that were she a child now, she would have transitioned without a doubt. And while I, of course, can't say if the statement is true, uh, I want to think about the slippage of signs that takes place within this narrative's jump in time. In moving between the 1970s and 2010s, O'Malley creates a hypothetical narrative that inconsistently frames gender and the meanings attached to it as universal and ahistorical. In the documentary, however, O'Malley does not grapple with this shift in time that she herself evokes. Her move from, I thought I should be a boy, to her third conditional statement, if I was a child now, I would have been transitioned, thus carries over the signifier of boy from one moment to another without grappling with the change in what boy or girl or indeed childhood, agency, autonomy, and subjecthood signifies from then to now. In not grappling with this change in signification, O'Malley elides her desires for autonomy and for boyhood, equating them with an ahistorical desire for transition rather than acknowledging them as historically situated des desires for occupying different positions in relation to power. Implicit in O'Malley's third conditional grammar is that her desire for boyhood then was simply about wanting to be a boy, while trans children's current desires for boyhood are less innocent. And we can remember that phrase, it's that fear that children. Unlike O'Malley, O'Malley implies, these children, particularly those who are gendered as girls within turf discourse, are the ones that are mistaking their de desire for a world free of patriarchy for a desire to be a boy. This framing of transness within gender critical and turf activism has had extraordinary implications for trans children, as well as for those people who care for them. The first interview in O'Malley's documentary brings this into stark relief. O'Malley interviews Rachel, a parent of Matt, um, who, uh, who's a 13 year old trans boy at his home in South Wales. Upon arriving at their home, O'Malley is shrugged off by Matt, who, quote, cannot be bothered to leave his room and discuss his transition with O'Malley. In his place, his mother and O'Malley have a conversation about the complexities of raising a trans son. The interview, however, uh, is overshadowed by O'Malley's interjections as she casts doubt into Rachel's narrative of support by raising the specter of her own third conditional trans childhood. For me, I would have been very much like Matt when I was a kid, O'Malley tells Rachel. I went into puberty and it was awful, but ultimately it was the solution for me. I felt nature's so much bigger. I think I'm strong, nature's so much bigger than me. At the end of the interview, Matt begrudgingly joins his parents to say bye to, Mally, to O'Malley. And right as she's about to leave, however, O'Malley turns to Matt and tells him that they were there discussing, quote, the issues, as well as her own experience as a kid where I, O'Malley, uh, was a boy for a time. As he turns to O'Malley in what might be understood as a glance of hopeful recognition, O'Malley continues by saying that she wanted to point out to him and his parents that, quote, the door is always open to go in different directions. Disappointed, Matt turns from O'Malley to his mother attempting to demonstrate both her support of her child and her eagerness to not make the mistake of supporting something that he might later regret, Rachel asks Matt if he would ever detransition. Interrupted with a hard and fast no, before she can even finish the question, Rachel attempts to confront herself, or perhaps O'Malley, as she says, but I do ask you though. Interrupting again with a wary sigh, Matt responds, you ask me all the time. In this moment, Matt reveals that the anxiety about transitioning is, of course, not his own. Matt's exasperation, as well as his initial refusal to speak with O'Malley, demonstrates that the question is not one he's asking of himself. 
naming it as his mother's question, as one she, O'Malley, and others ask again and again, Matt's refusal to engage demands in this moment that the anxieties which propel the asking of the question are others to deal with and not his. What Matt needs, rather, are modes of living genders of all kinds in ways that are free from prohibition, constriction, and repudiation. Expressing this need returns me to the central theme of today's panel, the question of embodied solidarities. And it's with that that I'll, I'll conclude. And I want to argue that there could be space within the hypothetical construction of trans childhood uh, in which to forge solidarities across cis and trans childhoods were this grammar not interrupted by cultural prohibitions. In my opening exploration of O'Malley's boyhood, I argued that taking her account seriously meant acknowledging that she was articulating the need for a space within childhood in which children can experiment with embodying and enacting freedom and agency through gender. Describing her own um, resilience in childhood, O'Malley mirrors Matt's strategy of refusal. People had to accept me as a boy and God help anybody who didn't, she says. I remember it haunted me as a question and it annoyed me because I knew I had to come out strong. I knew that. While we're only granted one short moment in which Matt, like O'Malley, has to quote, come out strong, we can speculate with all that we know about the extraordinary resilience of trans children and through Matt's own insistence that he interrupts those questions um, and those questioning his gender all the time, that this scene of refusal is also one of many in Matt's childhood. Acknowledging this shared strategy of refusal and insistence between Matt and O'Malley is really vital as it shifts the terms of what is at stake in the debate over trans childhoods away from this thing around whether or not a child or an adult is really trans and instead towards what Jules Jill Peterson calls quote ethical relation between children and adults. What is at stake here in these parallel scenes of childhood resilience then is less their claims to cis and trans positionings as natural, intelligible, or, or oppositional, but rather the shared intergenerational impact of living childhoods outside of gender's cultural limitations. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Jacob. Uh, and uh, thank you, Olga and Nekla. Um, so let's move straight away to our questions. I, I really wish we had the rest of the day, actually, to, to, to have just the discussion. Um, um, starting with the first question that I can see um, in our chat box. In the context of COVID, has moving online helped or hindered the advance of feminism in the academic world? And I'll take all the questions together, if that's okay, and I'll pose it to all three of you. Um, it's uh, linking to the previous question, to the first question. Um, the second question is, um, how conducive online, sp online spaces are to diluting, or better even equalizing, online spaces? Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, diluting power relations between actors and participants. Um, and uh, because you all three mentioned online spaces in one way or another, um, I wonder if we can take um, that question across our panel. Uh, Nicola, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. I mean, uh, I think one of my key arguments was, I don't know if I kind of emphasize that enough because I try to cover a lot of ground in my little present, short presentation was that it has been really amazing for us. You know, the fact the pandemic enabled us to come together. As I said before, we tried to do it 98, 99. We managed to have a couple of meetings only to come together, like as a network of people interested in Kurdish gender studies. It was just so difficult if you didn't have institutional affiliation or money and so on. So with this one, we feel so, it feels really empowering. We have ideas, we want to do something. We don't have to have a space. We don't have to have money. We're doing organizing, you know, um, the reading group, for example, I mean, um, we realize with the larger session, we don't get enough time to discuss. So we have little workshops and reading groups. And in this readings groups, we have smaller number of people coming, but attending regularly. And through that, we develop affinity and relationship. And so I find it very empowering. Thank you. And Olga? Thank you. Um, I agree, actually, with with what Nekla has said. Um, I think, in terms of in terms of 
COVID. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, COVID was a defining moment for for sort of advancing uh, connectivity online. I mean, of course, I think it was in a way equalizing experience because everybody has moved online from literally, you know, struggling to book a shopping slot to perhaps working online and every single part of our life has mo- has gone online really. But these spaces existed before. So I guess it's a some sort of lucky mix of unlucky circumstances and spaces that have already enabled us before to connect these ways. Um, I have to say though that COVID also has seen increase in online violence against women. Um, both online and, and sort of um, digital violence. So, for example, tracking online, things like that. Um, so I think I don't necessarily comment on it in the context of COVID. I think more generally, I think, yes, the online spaces allow us to connect with other feminists worldwide. Um, and I think it's something amazing to see that something happening, let's say, in a small town let's say in Poland you know gains attention from or support from an activist in Argentina and vice versa I mean the examples are endless really Um, so I think absolutely I would agree that it advances uh, feminism whether just in academic world I don't think so I think more broadly too Um, for me I think what's quite heartbreaking is the backlash that comes with it um, and the amount of abuse um, that is happening um, especially around debates that can be quite polarizing. Um, and this is really quite, I think, obstructive to advancement of feminism rather than um, helping it along. But I don't think online spaces alone can be blamed for that. Thank you, Olga. And Jacob? Yeah, I guess um, sort of thinking along those lines, I think of social media and the internet as an, just another kind of technology that people can use for for and against social movements. And so I'm not so sure that there's something so inherent to it that makes it good or bad for for feminism or feminisms. Um, I'll say in terms of, certainly in terms of um, trans activism and trans activism around trans childhood at the minute, it's a space um, or sometimes a small space for resource sharing and for care um, in uh, moments, but it's primarily uh, a hostile tool of violence and misinformation. Um, It's a space of platforming um, extraordinarily uh, virulent um, uh, and disingenuous information about trans people. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm quite wary. I was actually thinking, Olga, as you were giving your presentation about, you know, do we just need to, as a feminist move, actually come off of Twitter and remove ourselves um, from social media, even just as a way of enacting a form of care for one another. Um, The amount of stress that I've seen people under because of social media, the amount of um, students and uh, faculties and, and friends who I've had to care for because of the harassment that they've received on Twitter um, uh, just makes me think that perhaps another kind of engagement, an offline one, might be something that's actually a little bit more uh, closely aligned with our politics of embodied right, rather than digital solidarities. Thank you. Thank you all three so much. Uh, I can see we have another comment slash question, uh, but we're very, very close. And I need to apologize. We have started eating into a break. uh, So my apologies for this. Um, Could I please invite everyone to unmute themselves for just one second, just to give a very warm round of applause for our speakers. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Avi. Thank you, everyone.